with the Halloween season upon us again, I wanted to share some stories that were unnerving. I find these stories particularly off-putting because they're anchored mostly in reality, peppered only by one or two odd events that make you pause and consider what's really going on. It is stories like this that I find the most intriguing. By changing one element, the mundane become bizarre. So once again, sit back, turn down the lights if you dare, and enjoy these stories of the Halloween season. My brother's high school marching band was invited to perform in the Fiesta Bowl Parade in 1988. We flew to Phoenix, Arizona for that week and turned it into a family vacation. While my brother hung out with his band buddies, I was able to spend some time with my mother. The evening before the parade, Mom and I decided to drive to a restaurant recommended by our hotel. It was a bit of a drive, they said, about half an hour or so. They gave us a map, which I studied closely, as I would be driving after dark. At about 5.30, with the sun setting, we jumped in our rental car and drove toward Pinnacle Peak. It was to be a drive I would not soon forget. Our restaurant destination was a steakhouse, an upscale roadhouse, known for big portions, large drinks, and because of its remote location, more affordable prices. I was to be the designated driver that night. I was looking forward to sitting down and chatting with my mom. The solitary drive out into the desert at dusk was helping me to focus on some delicious appetizers. As my mind wandered, I became aware of a dark car behind us. The further away from the city, the more traffic thinned out, but this one car had persisted. Now perhaps it was the aggressive manner of their driving or the fact that they were following just a bit too close, or perhaps some other sense of foreboding that had drawn my attention. I started to fixate on this car. Had they been following us out of the city? I tried to remember if they'd been there the whole time. It seemed as if they had. I decided to slow down slightly and let them pass while we were still in the suburbs. They also slowed down. I then sped up and took my first turn toward the desert. They also turned and matched my speed. There was only one other truck on the road ahead. I sped up to get a bit closer. The dark car behind stayed with us. Then the truck ahead slowed and turned off into a dusty dirt road and was gone. I glanced in the rearview mirror and noticed that the dark car was much closer. <laughs> I turned to my mother and said, I have an odd feeling that we're being followed. I expected her to be surprised by this, but instead she said, yes, that black car, I've been watching it for a bit. By now we were well out of town and still a few miles from our final destination. My mother was surprisingly calm and I said, well, there are only two more roads we can turn on and neither takes us back to town. I was about to suggest that we make a run for the roadhouse when my mom said, at the next intersection, Put your left turn signal on, but wait. We pulled up to a four-way stop. I put on my signal and waited anxiously for the black car to pull in behind us and show their intentions. My heart dropped as they too <laughs> signaled and pulled in behind us. My mom said, okay, turn it off and let's get to the restaurant. I turned off the signal and drove deliberately ahead into the night. The other car switched off their signal and bolted after us, seemingly caught a bit off guard by my false signal. There was nobody else on the road as we approached the last intersection. The black car was glued to my bumper. 
We would have to turn left, and it would be about another mile to other buildings, people, and some manner of safety. As I reached the intersection, I came up with a plan to try and lose our pursuer. Straight ahead, the road was separated by a narrow median. The lanes were very tight on either side, and I told my mom quickly that I was going to pull a fast and tight U-turn just after the short median, and to be ready. With no hesitation, I raced the car through the intersection and accelerated into the dark. The black car was caught off guard by my rapid departure. In a moment, I saw them start to pursue us. I rocketed to the end of the median, my right wheel running in the gutter. The instant I passed the island, I turned forcefully to the left and spun the car back in the opposite lane. My hubcaps nearly hit the curb as I centered the car and raced back to the intersection we had just crossed. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the other car rushing past, the narrow median the only thing separating us. I floored it back to the other road and took a sharp right. The black car did not expect the tight radius and ended up pressed up against the curb, forcing them to reverse. This maneuver bought me the time to rocket down the road to the restaurant. The black car did follow, but the final stretch was curvy and their headlights were not able to close the gap. I still recall how odd it was to have my mom encouraging me to drive faster, drive faster, to make it to the restaurant in time. We did not want that black car to reach us. We pulled into the parking lot and slipped amongst the other cars. I turned off our lights and watched as the black car raced past, having not seen us turn in. All in all, I felt we had escaped a close call. As I said, this was a drive I would not soon forget. Sometimes bizarre happenings come out of nowhere, in the most mundane of ways. The most unsettling events are those that happen close to home, in surroundings you think you know. My good friend had invited me over to watch movies at her house, while she babysat her younger brother. Our homes were separated by a small stretch of dense forest, and a small path wound between our yards. In her yard, this path passed a small landscaped area, with ornamental bushes, a flower bed, and some random concrete statues. One of these was in the form of an old hobo. When it was late enough to put her brother to bed, we continued watching scary 1950s movies. Viewing the yard outside the window, it appeared much darker. We could just make out the statue not far beyond the window. We continued to casually watch the movie. My friend even talked on the phone with some of her friends. She happened to glance out the window. This is when it started. She froze and actually told her friend that she would have to call her back. She tapped me on the shoulder. Look at the statue, she said in hushed tones. Are the eyes glowing? What? I replied and looked out the window. No, it must be a trick of the light, I responded, a bit annoyed that the movie was being interrupted. I swear they look brighter. Look, she insisted. I looked at the statue, and its eyes did appear to glow. Surely it was light from the house, I thought. It was odd, though, that the glow was just around the eyes. We ignored it as a trick of the light and got back into our movie. But the figure, just out beyond the walk and in our peripheral vision, persisted. As the night became darker and clouds blocked the moon, we could not resist another glance toward the hobo. It, it seemed as if the eyes began to take on an unsettling glow of their own. The eyes were bright enough to hold our fixed attention. By this point, I was working up my nerve to go out and examine the statue when my friend gasped and asked, did it just move? 
I had not been looking, and I was not sure. But this was getting silly. I hadn't seen any motion, just those glowing eyes. It had to be some odd reflection. It just had to be. When the movie ended, just before midnight, I told my friend it was time for me to go home. I took a long breath and stepped out into the backyard. In the still dark night, the only sound as I boldly strode past the statue was my footsteps. In the back of my mind, I was glad I made it home just moments before midnight. I still feel a slight chill whenever I think back to that night in the backyard and the eerie glowing eyes. My father is a talented stained glass artist. He created works all over Indianapolis during his long career. He traveled to many places, including old churches, businesses, and homes, to replace or repair centuries-old installations, as well as install new pieces. I recall Dad mentioning something very odd happening at an old farmhouse on the west side of town. He was laboring alone on the second floor. He was working on a pane of glass, and his tools were laid out around him. As he worked, he glanced away, and when he turned back, the screwdriver was suddenly gone. He had looked away for only seconds. After trying to find the screwdriver for some time, my father went downstairs to talk to the owner. He pondered aloud, had he perhaps left the screwdriver elsewhere? He asked if the owner had seen it. She cryptically replied, Oh, are you missing something? That must be the ghost girl. The lady said that they had a spirit on the second floor that would play innocent tricks like this from time to time. My dad was not convinced, still thinking he must have left it somewhere else in the house. Perhaps the owner's son, just back from school, had moved it as a prank. When my father went back upstairs, the screwdriver was back in place. Uh, no one else had been upstairs. This is the only time I can recall my dad mentioning anything even remotely supernatural. He's just not prone to that sort of interpretation, so this was really odd for him. The owner said that she was happy that Dad was able to finish his work. Other repairmen had come to the old farmhouse only once and refused to return. This was many years ago. When I recently asked my father if he had ever done another job at the farm again, he said no. However, he did add that on the rare occasions when he finds himself on the road, he will glance at the farmhouse as he passes just to see if he catches the glimpse of someone, perchance a girl, in the upstairs window.